Ten Candles, Hidden Agenda and Cosmic Encounter. This is Staying In. Just us. Just us again. Just on that, back on that tuna bus. Yep. Well, yep. Um, hang on, let me just check. Yeah, better be. Pete! Dan! <laughs> yeah, oh. I'm, I'm sat right next to you. Oh, All right. right, oh yeah. I've oh, just met Hi. Poppy. Oh yeah, and Poppy's here as well. Poppy? Yeah, she kind of interrupted me, but yeah, I've I've been here all along. Dan has always been. <laughs> <laughs> We've always known that, that Dan is always there in our hearts. Anytime there's a podcast where I don't seem to appear, I'm always sitting right there. I'm just choosing not to speak. <laughs> <laughs> speak his name and he will appear. A bit awkward for his infant son, but uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, we don't take advantage too much. <laughs> you, just, you just hear Toby crying. Yeah. Holly walks in an empty room. So, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> Toby's on the floor. Just like... <laughs> Dan's been just been summoned. <laughs> yes, we're here. It's it's the big, it's the mega birthday celebration weekend. It is. Whoop, whoop. As we uh, as we are want to do, um, at least once a year, because that's it's generally when birthdays fall, isn't it, Sam? It's genuinely, what defines a birthday. So yeah, it's been fun, but obviously we are missing a crucial member of the of the team. He's been beaten by Emma. Yep. Storm. The beast from the east has claimed another victim. It was actually Storm Emma. It was the beast from the east meeting Storm Emma coming up from the coming up from the southwest. Um that that meant that Megabus decided not to travel and so Pete couldn't make it. So um I don't know, a moment of silence or not. I mean, he's not dead. No. That is true. He, I mean, literally, all that happened is he couldn't get on a bus. Let's not over-exaggerate this. <laughs> I was thinking maybe that we just surreptitiously leave gaps in the audio for us to then, through the magic of digital editing, like, put Pete back into the just show. Put an, uh, so we just, just <laughs> Should we just get some ums from Pete ums? We just ask some questions and we'll just leave a space for answers and we'll put in Pete's answer afterwards. I'd say, why, why don't we do it? So we put a break in and um, but we always go, hang on a minute, Pete, hang on a minute. <laughs> like, just interrupt him. <laughs> hang on, yeah, yeah, you can talk after after us. We'll just pull in audio from previous episodes and drop it in again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's always got the same things to say, really. But it's an opportune time when Pete's not here because... Pete obviously isn't a part of the 2018 Round the Houses Challenge. <sighs> Which you talked about before. Yes, we have talked about before, but I think it's a good chance to do an update. Not only have Dan and I advanced in our age considerably since we we started, uh, but also it's good to kind of see where, where we're at. So we've done two months. Uh, Dan, just do a recap of what the challenge actually actually is. So the, So the challenge is we have to... Each of us individually Good. Uh, run, <laughs> run, cycle, or row a distance from my house yeah. to Sam's house to Chris's house to Pete's house back to mine. So there is a set distance to do all that, which is around about 730 kilometers. Now, in order to accomplish this, we are recording kind of exercise that we're doing. It can be anything. The exercise can be taken from going to the gym, from going outside and running, whatever you want to do. As long Dance. as you can. <laughs> dance if you can measure the distance that you've danced absolutely it can be included obviously an element of competition will inevitably happen because we are going against each other more or less but there's no kind of solid rules as you can't do this you can't do that you can include any kind of exercise that you want provided that you can kind of measure it by distance how far is a bicep curl <laughs> Well, that's kind of just like clam pulling yourself <laughs> along the floor. <laughs> I dragged myself. That's kind of like half a oh foot gosh. to Liverpool. But also, hang on. So what have people been doing? Because all I see is we have this Google Drive that Dan has set up for us. And I just see the numbers going up. Yep. And that's the thing that gets me out of bed in the morning to go and do this thing. How are people covering that distance? What exercise are you doing? Is it just running that people are doing? Exc- I, I'm just exclusively running. Um, I have a, like a little map around where I live. I think it's a really good idea if you find the you know getting yourself motivated around exercise difficult i think that a little friendly competition goes a long way because like for me the best thing i bought when i started running was a gps watch so at least i could keep track of you know how far i was doing like what you know what sort of distance i was doing and how long it was taking me so i was able to like compete against myself but i you know i don't really run much faster than i do normally now so having this sort of challenge of actually increasing my distance has been really handy so i've just been 
I think you're you're saying, Chris, but like slowly steadying, like increasing my distance run by run. Yeah. So now I'm running further per week than I ever have done. I don't think if it wasn't for like this challenge, I've just been keeping on just, I, I just had like a little 5k route and I do that three times a week. But now I'm doing at least eight kilometers uh, per run um, three times a week. Well, that's my aim for this month. Yeah. Yeah. I'm I'm doing something very similar. Mine's like the rice on the checkerboard. I started off doing like two kilometer runs and I've been adding a kilometer each week. So I yeah. do two runs a week. That is one kilometer more. Um, obviously, that takes a little bit more time now because sometimes I'm running for like an hour. Yeah. Each run's like an hour and I have to factor that into my time. But like that thing about competition we've talked about before, it happened the other day where literally <laughs> I'd had a long day at work in, on Wednesday and it was the last day of the month of February because February is a short month. Yeah. And I could see that I was behind you too. You know, it was snowing. <laughs> That was the beast from the east. That was, yeah. 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 Um, my girlfriend was like, you're not going to go and run it today, are you? You're mad. Don't do it. I said, but look, look how far Pete... And- oh, sorry, ha- not Pete. Yeah, Pete's, yeah. Not, going- <laughs> Pete's not going anywhere. I Pete's said- currently listening, what, looking at the numbers go up, sat on his sofa. I was like, look how far Dan and Sam have gone. Where? Oh, God. Dan, where did Dan come from with this? I've yeah. got to, I've got to, suddenly Dan just came in. I was like, oh my gosh, I've got to try and beat this. So um, I just, I, I just, we got in. I said, okay, when I get halfway, put yep. the oven on. I've got some food prepared. I would just, um, I just got into my running gears. I did not want to go outside. It was freezing cold. I live on the side of the Mersey. Yeah. So it's freezing cold. And I just did um, the kilometers. It got so cold, my phone died. So I had to guess the distance <laughs> I was running. Roughly, I know that route. So, but I couldn't. More I'm... than Sam and. <laughs> Yeah, 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 that works. Yeah, yeah. and I made just it. Put home. that in, and, and I made it home. But I'm just worried as to what you know what this is going to do for me as we get further along. I love I, what I love about that story is the fact that like you're mainly just taking your phone with you to ring ahead to put the oven on when you're on your way back. <laughs> no. Like you're firing a flare. Like, <laughs> that's the message. Put the oven on. Your body just sat just looking at the window, looking out for this <laughs> light to come up. No, it's it's because I use the night fun um, Nike um, fitness app. Yeah. Um, and it's really funny. When I charged my phone afterwards, it was like, you have covered five kilometers. Distance. I'm sorry, distance five kilometers. Time taken, two hours. And because <laughs> We are disappointed in you. Um, so I screwed that up for me. But, oh, God, I had a funny thing the other day where um, park runs are really good. Have you ever done a park run? Uh, no, but um, a, few people, a few people that I work with have uh, done them and helped run them. Yeah. Have you heard of this, Dan? Are these the ones where kind of... It's kind of people can come from anywhere and they can all join together and run together. That's it, yeah. It's a free thing. You basically get sent a barcode and it's all staffed by volunteers and it happens in like most parks across the country on like on a Saturday morning, there's some are 5K, some are 10K routes. Where my girlfriend lives in the park nearby, there's a 5K route and, and they meet every Saturday morning. And it's great because you've got your barcode, they scan it at the, begin- at the end and they can tell you your time so you can just keep your PVs, you don't even have to measure it yourself. Yeah. But I turned up there just to do my run through the park and I, I joined the end of their run and it was, it was really lovely. Just starting, I've been running for about, about five metres and people were clapping me as if it was my last lap, <laughs> giving me all this encouragement and he, support. It was really lovely to have lo- that. He looks fresh. <laughs> And, I, you know, I had that smug kind of air of superiority yeah. overlapping people who are just knackered because I'd just started. But it was just really nice to have that kind of support. I, I once uh, accidentally walked into the Manchester Marathon and the 10K. I was walking to work. I was going to say, you didn't, you didn't just kind of find yourself in the middle of it Yeah, running. yeah, yeah. Not running. And, yeah. he, was, I, and I, he was so polite, he just I, had to carry on I was with walking it. to work and then suddenly, like, like yours, as everyone just started to clap me like, oh, he must be doing it. He must be doing like some sort of challenge. He's wearing a backpack and he's got like a, a coat and he's trousers in, he's on. He's in jeans. <laughs> he's in jeans. This is, this is ingenious. And, and no, I just had to sort of sidle my way out of all these runners. <laughs> make way, make way. <laughs> Take some Haribo. <laughs> a free bottle of water. So no, it's really interesting. But I, what 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 I really like about this is that Dan has been mapping where we are, yeah. relatively speaking, in terms of the distance we've covered. I run a bit differently to you guys. Yeah, um, like arms in the air, yeah, flailing <laughs> like around. You just don't care. <laughs> yeah. So uh, because of kind of work Skips. and life, work and life commitments, it's a bit more difficult for me to kind of when I get home to then go back out for a run and stuff like that. So I instead go to the gym and and exercise that way this this all came from me wanting to just get fitter this year um so i joined a gym it was kind of a, a relatively cheap gym because i just need a couple of pieces of equipment i don't need all the fancy things you get from like the more expensive gyms and so what I, fancy things do you imagine are in expensive gyms uh saunas and all oh, right kind of those kind of if you imagine kind of what you think of like the health club type things yeah which are kind of like 60 quid a month or something like that i've done that what do you mean i, I paid 
Lisa and I both paid about 700 quid each to join a proper fancy gym. See, I paid how 20, how did, I paid how did that go? a month. Yeah, um, it went all right. They had like this little vibrating plate you can st- stand on to do your warm downs afterwards. And they even in there, actually, my favorite bit of equipment that they had in there was a treadmill that you powered yourself. What, you just you crank it up to start off with? No, no, like <laughs> it's powered by how fast you run. Oh, I see. So you have to keep like it's re- like in terms of in terms of like actually building up like your fitness to running, it's one of the best things you can mm. use because you are powering the momentum of the treadmill. Yeah. So if you don't keep running, then the, you will just like be carried away from the from the treadmill and it will just stop. Which is it's a really weird experience that you're powering the machine that you're that you're using. It's really strange. Anyway. It's when you start going slowly and all the power and it just cuts out, you're like, I have no idea what's happening now. It's, it's not measuring my calories anymore. And then all the lights were going dim <laughs> in the gym and it was really weird. You realise that you were powering the entire yeah. gym. <laughs> so yeah, so um, Dan, where are we at now? So at the end of January, yeah. uh, at, at that point, Sam, you were in the lead. Uh, yes. Shortly followed by myself and then Chris, you were a little bit further behind. So at that point, Slow Sam, time. me and you were just outside of Bletchley. Ooh, Bletchley so, Park. And then, oh, and then, well, the Enigma was cracked. We did some. Indeed. We did some. We did some coding. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Chris. You, at that point, you were just outside Leighton Buzzard. Oh. Um, so you, so you, but you were, you were, weren't far behind. And obviously, you've had quite a big month. I in have. Yeah. February. You've had a big month. <laughs> <And> <laughs> in, fe- in February, you've had quite a big month. So you've, you've caught up. And actually, we're very bunched together now. Yeah, so we are. We're, totally. we're, we are kind of all, all lined up. And we're currently just outside of rugby. Oh, that's where I live. It's just or where you used to live. live. Not yeah. now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's where I was born. Yeah. Oh, so, wow. You're so a celebrated son of rugby, aren't you, Sam? Yes, I am. Yeah, there's a statue. It, I mean, it says William Webellus underneath the statue, but everyone knows it's, <laughs> it's, it's really me. Yeah, yeah. Um, we could pop in and see my dad. That'd be great. Yeah. So, so far, we've left my house. We've gone past my old flat in Watford. We're now outside, just outside of where S- Sam grew up. So, we're, yeah. we're literally kind of going through a, like a history of our lives as well. Wow. That'd be wonderful. But I quite like the fact that we talked before about kind of it being a narrative. And I like the narrative of even though we're kind of, it is a competitive thing, we're actually just kind of all cycling or running together. Just yeah. On, just on a road, to just basically side by side, just down the down the road. It's quite nice. Rather nice. than being all split up, which I thought would happen. Yeah. At the moment, we are still all bunched together. So we're just running in kind of um, in convoy. That's great. I, I do enjoy that. And, like, and we're going away for a week, aren't we, Chris? We certainly With are. With Pete, so. if he can make it. He's not been mega bus. Definitely. We cancelled the bus to Salzburg. Um, so I'm really tempted to take my running stuff with me. Okay. Because I'd love to like... I just want to see Pete's face when you both pull out your running gear and he just the horror crosses his face. Oh, I would, oh I my would like... God. I, I brought my spike. <laughs> I would love that. Running along the river in Salzburg would be awesome. Yeah, exactly. Like, I, th- I think like when... Um, I don't know if you ever told you guys, but I've cycled the, across the north of France. I think like cycling and running, exercising in the, in the place is one of the best place, one of the best ways to see like a country and experience it because you're on like ground level. You're not just driving past in a car. So you've got time to take in the environment and take in you know, what you see and um, get an idea of the lay of the land. And so you, because you have that time to sort of encounter the geography that you're in, it's a really lovely way to see to see places that you've never been to before. And I think that, you know, because we're going away and it's going to be kind of like a self-sufficient holiday, like we're traveling across three cities in Europe. And, you know, we for, for the most part, we're going to be staying in accommodation where we have to feed ourselves. So if we're able to go out and go for a run and see like, oh, there's a nice shop oh there's a nice restaurant this looks like a nice cafe or this looks like somewhere we can go and visit it's it's really good like when we when we... <laughs> sit down have a free course dinner and then run back <laughs> oh we just had a great meal uh you weren't invited but like when when we went away i went away at christmas time and i went for a run and i was able to use that run to kind of go right this is how we get to the pub or this is a nice walk over here so it's really great i love it so yes exercise <laughs> is good exercise is good if you're Trying to beat your e- friends. Exercise gets the staying in seal of approval. It's been a bit. It's been a bit of a groggy morning. We were up late last night partying. Yeah. We were, what we were doing, Sam? We were. We were. Um, well, we had the hot tub going. We had the 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 Chablis. Chablis? No, Cristal. I was going to say, it was champagne. <laughs> champagne, yeah. We had that. We had that. It's champagne or Chablis. It's one of the two. <laughs> is Chablis the shit one or is that Baby Sham? That's what I'm thinking of. Hang on. Champagne. <laughs> Champ- Hang on, you realise that Baby Sham isn't just a small champagne. You went on quite a little journey there, Sam, didn't you? No, Baby Sham is like a. 
shit lemonade drink. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It? It's, it's not just a little champagne. <laughs> Sam, <laughs> Sam learned this on his cycle of food. <laughs> Cy- oh, let's get some of those baby shams. It's just baby champagne, isn't it? It's far, it's far cheaper than buying a big <laughs> champagne. <laughs> I love the fact this is a man who cycled through France. <laughs> Just across the north, Chris, as we know. Right. That's not Outside champ- the Champagne that's region. That's champagne country. Fueled by baby champ. <laughs> that's like Brittany, so yeah, it's very good. Like, it's a very good cider there, actually. Because actually, yeah. Yeah, because, well, we were, we were up late because um, we were playing games. That's what we do. Because we're, ru- we're rock stars. we party. Because um, last night we played Ten Candles. Just the three of us, which I was a little bit hesitant about because... Sometimes RPGs have a good number, like four is a good number, like a GM and then three people to yeah. kind of bounce off stuff. Ten Candles, it turns out, is super fun to play with three people. I mean, even in the rules, didn't you, didn't you say you can play two people? Yeah, so when I looked online, it said two plus yeah. rules was Two plus. And I can see how that is possible. It's yeah, a very because, flexible structure. Yeah, I, I kind of had to go onto Twitter and apologise to the um, designer of the game, Stephen Dewey, for butchering the rules because I made it probably sound like the most un- 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 like really just awful game. But basically, so Ten Candles is an RPG. It's available to buy online. Uh, I think my copy was about seven quid to print off a print off a PDF. And the conceit of the game is that you've got ten candles lit in the middle of the table and. Um, you got a bowl of water in the middle for safety. Ugh, Cameron's Britain. <laughs> um, and yeah, I mean, you dated it very well, though. It's May's Britain <laughs> at the moment. We're still feeling the effects, Chris. That's true. Conservative Britain. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so the, the the game starts with uh, each player who's not the GM creating their character. And so I got both of you to give your characters a vice and a virtue. And that was simply one word, a virtue. The idea behind it is something that should solve problems. A vice is something that should create problems in the game. Can you remember what your... Yes, well, you, it's interesting because you actually we actually wrote them. And I was, I'd created this lovely character in my head and then you made us promptly swap them with each yeah. other. So I'd, mm-hmm. I didn't realise, but actually I was writing the vice and virtues for Dan, Dan's character. So Dan had to create a character from these two qualities. So yeah. I think I put in recklessness as my vice. Yeah, and forgiving. Uh, yeah, and forgiveness, forgiveness as my virtue. virtue. Dan. Which which did completely change my character. Yeah, yeah. And actually ended up creating key character points mm-hmm. for that. Um, the ones I created were um, arrogance yeah. and protective. Yeah, which is um, which is really interesting again. And so you and then so after you make those two bits of your character. So this is, so you know, this is what was lovely about Ten Candles is like me as a person running it, my preparation was very minimal. I just made myself like a little crib sheet of notes and rules to go through, familiarise myself with the sort of the, the small paragraph of the story of where the game was going to be set and, and that was kind of it. Um we like went through the character creation process all together as as a thing. So we're all invested in these people that these these two people that were going on the journey. So after you do your vice and virtue, the you then each create a moment, which I think I think is a wonderful idea. I think there's it struggles a bit at this point because you would de- we were starting to start, kind of deal with a bit more abstract terms. So like getting across what the moment is. I think if we played it again, you would both have a better idea of what it is to create that moment. And the idea of the moment is that this is a scene that your character will go through at some point in the in the experience. It's something that your character will find hope in. Mm. So, Chris, your character, your moment. It was because basically um, this was set on a cruise ship. Mm-hmm. And I had in my head that this person was some engineer. And they had this, they, they'd kind of almost personified this ship. Yeah. And they were used to the kind of the sounds of that ship. And because those sounds were now absent in this scenario, they wanted to just hear the sound, those familiar sounds. Yeah, so they would find that hope ship. within yeah. that. And then yours, Dan, was... Mine was be- because of the kind of the traits that I was then given in terms of forgiving us. If I'd created a kind of a, a story for myself with a kind of a, a, a marriage which needed repairing and there was a, a child. But so I'd had a daughter. So um, my moment of hope was to hear her voice again. Yeah. So that that was what I was kind what of searching. What you found out that was that's so, and then you go from creating the moments to the vice and the virtue, and then you each create a brink for the other character. And the brink is the idea behind it is this is a this is something that is your character something that your character has done at their weakest when they've been pushed to the absolute limit, and 
this sits at the bottom of the bottom of the pack of the of the of the virtues of, of things that make up your character and what they'll go through throughout the game and it's a lovely idea that someone else creates them this for you it's something that they have seen you do someone else has seen you at their at their weakest and then another player creates the starts to put the plant the seeds to what the enemy is of the game because i had no idea of that in the rule book the enemy the thing that we're fighting against is just called them and i have no idea what they are are they supernatural are they like a, a shady government agency you know I, uh, and dan you wrote what you'd seen them yeah doing which was rising from the ocean in this scenario so immediately we had this like this cross collaboration idea that you know the story wasn't all mine to tell like you hadn't laid out a big long story yeah. that you were going to just force us to go down. You'd each create, and you, from the from the beginning, you'd each created moments, which are elements of the story that once they're on the top of your pack, we all start working the narrative towards reliving that moment for that character. So we're all jointly invested in there. There was nothing, and and importantly, there was nothing that I was hiding from any of you. There was no secret. There was no like, ha ha ha, this is something I pulled out of my pocket, or this is the direction I wanted you to go all along. Which is a beautiful thing about the game. I really felt like we were all working to create the create what was happening in in the story. And the beauty behind that is how the narrative control works. So once we'd done this character creation, we got the ten candles are lit in the center. Um, a beautiful thing that then you both went and did was went and recorded your like final words, your epitaph. Um, onto I just got you to record them in a WhatsApp group and then send them to me. And then the game begins, and essentially um, we're just each sort of exploring the space and telling the story. And whenever I deem as the GM that you need to encounter conflict, then you roll dice. And you roll the same amount of dice, and there are candles lit at the table. So at the start of the game, you're rolling 10. If any, if any of those dice roll a 6, then you succeed, whatever you're trying to do. But if you ever roll a 1, you lose that dice from the pool of dice that you're rolling from for that scene um and then as the game goes on as less as candles go out if you ever fail from that scene if you ever fail a dice roll you don't roll any sixes then a candle gets darkened and that's the end of the scene and then we move on to the next one and i think as we found the scenes could be depending on what we're doing could yeah. be in this could be a tiny tiny scene or yeah. they could be really expansive and go for ages depending because on how, depend, how good yeah if we keep roll. rolling well yeah the, that scene just extends and extends yeah. and extends whereas we could have the first challenge fail it and that scene has literally been us walking up some stairs or something like that yeah. so and there's that constant jeopardy of at any point the candles could go out yeah and what and what's laid out in the rules and what's really interesting is that as you start losing dice because there's candles going out so say that we've got to like there's only seven candles lit so you've only got seven dice me as the gm i get the three dice you don't have anymore and i roll those when you roll your um dice to see if you um succeed the conflict if i roll more sixes than you do i get narrative control over that over that situation mm. Which I think is a really interesting idea, the idea that I can almost, as the game goes on, I have, I start to have more control over the story that you're trying to tell. And it's kind of a really nice way of simulating that horror aspect that, just like with Dread, with the Jenga Tower, how as the game went on, that was meant to represent, you know, your sanity, you know, more blocks have been removed from the Jenga Tower, so it was loose, it was wobbly. Instead, Ten Candles does, does that through the dice mechanic, the fact that as the game goes on as characters you lose more control over the story that you're trying to tell and the success yeah. that you're trying to have in a certain situation and that's why it lends itself really well to the ghost story because or, or, yeah. or the, this kind of horror trope because often mm -hmm. it, the best ones are where you're kind of vying for control of that story yeah um, and mechanically it works very well as well because collectively to begin with if you imagine this being a kind of a canvas where we're all applying the broad brush strokes in yeah. it. and then you have given the confidence then to be given more paintbrushes to do those lovely little bits of detail, those little vignettes as you're reading us and where we are in that situation, how our characters developed. So you're it's it's so it becomes this really kind of very complicated kind of structure, but it but it doesn't start complicated. It starts off in a manner that is is it uh, puts you at ease and puts us at ease. Yeah, definitely. It was, it was really really a, an enjoyable experience. I think that. It was a shame Pete wasn't here, but 
I think what that does do is at least gives us a chance to like play it again with Pete mm. at some point. And I think um, it does it does demonstrate that I, I mean I don't know that that many RPGs that you could play with such a small number as this, but mm-hmm. it does demonstrate that it can be done in a really small, really intimate environment. Yeah, because it was and and it suited it because in the in the um, as part of the player uh, guide, it comes with uh, loads of different modules of different settings that you can that you can host it. And I was when it was a, when it was me with the three of you originally like i I thought i didn't like the idea i I like the idea of the cruise ship but i thought there's three of you it's quite a lot in quite a constrained environment you i felt like you could do a lot of things quite easily like you could just quite easily go down to the engine room and and sort it out and figure it out but because it was just a two of you i thought right that's perfect like for some reason just the two of you being in this isolated environment on this cruise ship was a lot more dramatic than saying having you trying to escape an island or trying to you know escape a school or you know infiltrate well, what, something what worked really well because there was only two of us quite often we were at odds as to what we wanted to do mm-hmm. and so in in the kind of what i think it helped in terms of developing characters and stuff is that we would be ha- we would have to have conversations about yeah. it it couldn't just be if so for example if pete was here and i wanted to go up a flight of stairs and chris wanted to go down a flight of stairs yeah pete would have the deciding vote because it would be two two to yeah one. So exactly yeah but with with this it, it we had to talk talk things through, and I had to understand Chris's point of view. Chris had to understand my point of view. So we there was a narrative reason to do things as opposed to I think I think the story thinks we should go upstairs. Or kind yeah, of thing like that. and and crucially that led to the fact that because in D and D that would be a persuasion role. Yeah, whether you succeeded in trying to get a character to do what you wanted to do, but because everything in Ten Candles is done through conversation, you know, if you win if you win the role. It's not me who decides how success goes. It's you decide how success goes for your character. I feel like you guys were much more invested in who your characters were and what their motives were and what they're actually doing in the situation than you have in any other RPG because your success or failure or what you're trying to do in a situation isn't defined by a dice roll. Like, I want to look around this. So, for example, in in Ten Candles, there was times when you wanted to, like, explore a room and, and look around it to see what you can find so in D D, it's kind of like you rolled a insert number as a gm that number equals to you have found this this mm. but missed this i decide whether you roll a conflict you roll a six it's up to you to decide what you find yeah yeah but also i love that idea that actually in terms of perception we can only see whatever we can actually see then because it depends on how many candles are lit at that point the yeah, actual exactly. how far we see. and obviously as the candles get burnt out we're able to see less and less around us it becomes it ramps up the tension even more and another point in terms of just as you were talking about we each write a virtue on a card um, a vice a moment a brink we have to sh- we put those in a particular order the brink always goes at the bottom yeah but we decide which one we're willing to kind of burn first we put that one at the top if we oh need yeah to. i didn't explain the, the burning thing so how the how the burning works and this is the reason why we've got the water in the table Ugh, corbin for political. what <laughs> i've just, 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 just been politically balanced <laughs> impartial blah uh, uh, the war on terror uh, bush um wilson <laughs> Lincoln, <laughs> <laughs> because um, Gaddafi, um, because <laughs> because you when you roll dice, as I said previously, if you roll a one, you lose that from the communal pool. Or say you roll, as one time Dan, you roll, you like had like five dice, and three of them were ones, and none of them were sixes. At that point, you can elect to burn the card that's currently at the top of your pile and visible to the rest of the group. In order to re-roll the ones that you have that you have rolled, but what you have to do in that situation is then find a way to weave that vice, that virtue, or that moment uh, into the conversation and into the scene that we're currently encountering, and then you burn it, and then you're able to re-roll the ones, which is brilliant because the idea of that is is that suddenly a you're almost being forced to think creatively about a situation like you, uh, Chris, your one of your vices was arrogance i had to, and i and, and i came to that to, point yeah and you had to like work out right how is his arrogance going to cause a problem in this situation for the story so that's really interesting but also it's the idea that at that moment you are we because we're burning the card suddenly there's more light in the room that there ever has been before mm. so it's almost that idea of 
you found some inspiration in your vice or you found some inspiration within this virtuous act that you're doing so so that's kind of the the figurative metaphor that goes along with the, why you were able to like re-roll success or re-roll to try and achieve what you want to do um it's a really nice touch but when i burned that arrogance suddenly um it it it, it kind of that that realization it was actually at the end of a scene it was a perfect point i mean like if you're plotting this i mean this is a i'm going to be using this with my students in drama in terms of how to not only create characters but also how to plot improvisation it's mm. such an elegant way of doing that um and sometimes where dan and i would get into debates and discussions i would try in my head i go, I want to do this and i'd look down and i'd see that i've still got this virtue of protectiveness yeah i think actually we shouldn't separate because at my core i want to be protective yeah. that's what dan has written for me so i will be i will join with dan and, and just that one word is enough to kind of inflame the imagination and protective obviously is a lovely bit of ambiguity there i could interpret that am i thinking about self-protection am i thinking yeah. about protecting dan actually am i thinking about protecting the ship itself so it was re- there's a real nice degree of flexibility it afforded us with just one word mm-hmm. as a kind of a vice or a virtue so yeah. just to just touch on a, a point you made a second ago sam in terms of kind of being um, invested in the characters so this yeah. is the third one that i've done um so obviously sam you'd you'd run one rpg before chris you'd run one before pete did one but i wasn't i wasn't involved no, in that you one. Weren't and, there. and then i i ran one originally replaced by another dad ironically yeah yeah we're, we're all interchangeable dad for dad um <laughs> So I, I know, and then I obviously I ran the original kind of original RPG we did, and obviously in the ones that I did, I put a lot of effort into those characters, and you think about backstories and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. I'm much more invested. I was much more invested in this character, and I reacted more closely to what how the character would in this yeah. in this game. Mm-hmm. Even though I made snap, a snap decision on who he was, I didn't even pick his, his personal virtues, personal yeah, yeah. traits. So all of those elements had to kind of happen in a single moment of figuring out. Okay. My character is forgiving. Okay, why? What What does that mean in terms yeah. of thing? And that that kind of created a whole story for his entire character. Yeah. Why was he on this cruise ship? That was created from from the stuff that was given to me in a moment. And that's what's actually really interesting: the fact that I was so invested in this character compared to other characters that I've done, even though I put a lot more work into other characters. Mm-hmm. And even though this is just a, this is, I mean, RPGs can run for months and months and months. Yeah. This was a two hour, two three hour, four but, hours. Was it, was four, it hours? four hours? Yeah, because when I took the picture of Dan like burning his first virtue, that was at half nine, and we finished about half one in the morning. Oh my god! But we talked a lot. But no, it was those last. You, ro- you rolled a lot of success. Oh, it was I, those last three candles that yeah, took yeah, ages yeah, it took to ages, burn out. Yeah, and actually, yeah, yeah. no, actually, yeah, and I accidentally blew out the last two in one you go, did, yeah, yeah. which was actually quite perfect. Actually. That, that's part part of the rules is is for whatever reason, if a candle goes out accidentally, like someone opens a window and it blows out, that's part that's part of the narrative. And we were down to two candles. And you decided to blow them out, but you blew out both of them at the same time. And it, and, and it was actually, it worked perfectly because it was a, a, a massive sort of crux at a turning point in the story. And it was kind of like, and and because you blew them out, it was kind of like, right, I, I just handed narrative control it's over to you. It's kind of end you. game here. Yeah, yeah. And I just nan- I ha- handed narrative control over to you at that point. Like, you were responsible. Um, one, the one thing I just, just wanted to say that I really liked, and it, we, it touched on the fact of... Um, you kind of creating story as you go along. Yeah. Now, right at the start, because obviously our story is based on a cruise ship, right at the start, one of the first decisions me and Chris had to make was I wanted to go up to the top deck, Chris wanted to go down to the bottom deck. Mm-hmm. And the way the story played out, we went up top and then it, we ended up at the bottom. Now, at the bottom in the engine room, the story that, Sam, you told and you created for us felt like a really great climax to the story. Good. And yet we could have gone straight down there so obviously that wouldn't have been the climax of the story because no. we could have gone down there immediately up in the start yeah so it's it's really interesting that the way the story progresses it almost naturally lends itself to building up the tension building up to a climax that you're kind of the the whole story itself has been in kind of informs your decisions yes so you know where we're going to at the end so you quite early on you could probably have an idea of okay this is something that's going to happen this is where I can maybe see the end game going to be, yeah. but that's never going to be set in stone because we could have gone there. You couldn't yeah. have if you knew to begin with it was going to be a story on a cruise ship. You could have thought, okay, well the end game is going to be the engine room, yeah. and then in the first two minutes we said let's go to the engine room, you'd have been like, oh god, ugh. but because you don't have that, yeah, you make it up and you as you go along, and the end point is just where the end point is. Yeah, exactly. And, well, the end point is when all the candles go out. Yeah. Which is, you know, the beauty of it is that we're all, again, with the narrative and how the story's going, is that I'm not the only one who knows when the end of the story is coming. We all know when the end of the story is coming because we've only got one candle left, or two in this case, with Chris's strong breath. (laughs) 
Like and that's, that sounds great. I like. Can I use that? Chris, <laughs> you have strong breath. If you ever come out with a range of mints, yeah, can you call it Chris's strong breath? Because like that, it's just that cross collaborative experience that we had. Like going back to the creatures and what they were, them. Like it was actually stuff that you both said that inferred what they were and kind of like the powers in inverted commas that they had. Like Chris, you walked in one point and you said that the water that they existed in was warm, and I was like. That's an interesting character point. So I built that into into like what they were doing, and then Dan, you mentioned your daughter. I was like, right, that's an interesting thing. I can try and weave weave that into the story that I'm trying to tell. And because we each had an investment into what was going on, just made it more more of a compelling. It's it's like narrative. we were all, it's like we were all GMs. Yeah, we were. Yeah, but you were just but players you, in it. Yeah, with like a, a, you were the capital G, let's say, and we were the lowercase G. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. There was, I remember one moment in particular where literally kind of, I kind of went cold. Yeah. And I brought, and I said that is my character, but I genuinely, I, I kind of, I felt kind of like Goosebumps kind of just, I just felt cold because of where the story had gone and what, what had happened. And I was just kind of like, wow, that's clearly got to me. I'm, I'm clearly invested in this story that this fictional character who I made up about an hour and a half ago. Yeah. I'm now having an, a physical reaction to something that has happened to him. It's the power of human imagination. You actually, you don't need to be prescriptive of us as a GM. You just give us a word, and we can literally yeah. build anything we want awesome. around it. So, um, yes, Chris, the, the, uh, Ten Candles wasn't the only narrative that ended a little bit too soon. For Ooh, us. what a what a seg! It was a beautiful segue there. <laughs> it's like you've done this before. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, Fifty-one times before, because we didn't just do stuff with a board no. uh, around a table. We did stuff on a screen as well. We did do stuff. On, we we played some Mario Kart. Yeah, very fun. Uh, Overcooked, which is quickly becoming a nice sort of a lovely little multiplayer game. Um, if uh, even on PlayStation, Xbox, PC, and Switch, it's on. There's actually a really nice version of it in PlayStation where even if you've only got two controllers, four players can still play, and you each share a controller, which it, which can be very manic. I can, I yeah, I can, can imagine. imagine. Yeah. Sink. Oh, oh my God. Um, but talking controllers, we played a PlayLink game, which is a... I've not played one of these before. Which is a weird PlayStation um, technology that they've, that they've sort of developed, which means that we all use our phones as controllers. Um, so we played Supermassive's game, Hidden Agenda. They've made The Impatient un- and Until Dawn, uh, which is probably their, their biggest sort of... Um, um, it was my favourite game of the year that it was released. I can't remember when that was. Um, but their motif, what they're kind of really famous for, is creating these really sort of realistic, intense environments. And they really go in hard on the butterfly effect. So everything we do is will have actions and repercussions of the game. And Hidden Agenda is essentially you're a cop um, on the trail of a serial killer and you think you've got the right guy in prison but he turns around and he says actually no I'm not the serial killer this person may or may not be and so you go and investigate um, a crime um, whilst other cops in your unit are convinced well he admitted to the killings he's on death row just let him die and he's gonna he's gonna die in 48 hours yeah so you've kind of got 48 hours to investigate to see if this is you know if an innocent man is essentially gonna die and the idea is is that we are using our phones to make decisions on behalf of the cop that we're playing. You know, do we agree with this person? Are we going to be angry with them? Are we going to, you know, let them off the hook? Uh, are we going to investigate this place or are we going to go to this place? And we chose the competitive mode, didn't competitive we? Competitive mode. So it's a cooperative mode where you're kind of all working collaboratively to tell a certain story. But it's competitive mode where we each get hidden agendas. So... Um, a bit like Ten Candles, essentially, I will ha- suddenly what will ping on my screen is my own objective that I have to do in this game. And if, yep. I, if I succeed in this moment, this scene, you get some points. I get some lovely points. Yeah. And what those points mean is that later on in the game, if I feel that I want to be, ad- um, that I definitely want to succeed in agenda, I can take control of choices. Mm-hmm. The only problem with that is that I'm gesturing to you, Sam, and you, Dan. That you have some sort I'm the one with the hidden investment. agenda. You also, the rest of the players, have to try and work out who is the person with the hidden agenda. And they also get points if they guess correctly. Mm-hmm. 
So it's like those kind of wonderful kind of social deduction games, with yeah, tabletop games, like the Resistance stuff like, like the that. the Resistance and Avalon and things like that. Like it really has that idea of you know that there's someone in your party who might be working against where you want the narrative to go, which is essentially how it works. But it's it's strange. It's such an odd. It was a really odd game in a way because I felt like it was trying to play like a board game plays, but because it but because it was a video game, I think we treated it as such. So I think that it wanted us to have a lot more conversations outside of the game, like on the board. Like we played Cosmic Encounter this weekend twice because it's that good. And the the beauty of Cosmic Encounter is because you're all sitting around a table and you're all different like alien factions with different investments in the game and you want to get different things out of it the majority of game exists in the acts of diplomacy or not with the players around the table like the negotiations you you forge and the factions and the alliances that you create because that's the situation that you're in with a board game you're face to face with the people that you're playing with however hidden agenda because it was on a screen i felt like we weren't really encouraged is the wrong word but it's just a different mindset isn't it we were we weren't having those conversations between us about because what it, what, what it wants you to do is if you've got a hidden agenda is to talk to the other players about why they should be reacting in that way or why they should be going there instead of there but instead it was kind of like we just gamed it a little bit yeah but i think it's also because the hidden agendas we were given weren't, weren't necessarily the ones we would pick yes and that's i think that's why we were a little bit dissatisfied with the ending of this game because mm. it wasn't the resolution that we wanted and i think it's in part because of the the choices we were kind of forced to make in order to compete with each other yeah and and because going back to uh, it's a bit of a shoddy comparison but i'm gonna make it anyway but going back to cosmic encounter because you start the game as a particular faction so in dan's case he played one where he was a pacifist and so he he had that from the start so immediately you created this role for yourself that you were a pacifist nation so that from the start to the end actually no halfway through we had to swap you had to swap powers with yeah. me so i became the pacifist but from that from the start to the point where you lost that power you that defined how you acted throughout the entire game and what you were doing. However, Hidden Agenda doesn't have this. You're constantly always changing from how you... So you're constantly always being asked to change how you feel about certain characters because you might be given a hindered, hidden agenda that, as Chris says, goes against what you, how you want to go and where you want the story to be. For example, it, it, the, if you're having a scene where the, the cop is investigating someone yeah. and the person you're investigating is acting really suspiciously, yeah. I might have a hidden agenda, which is prevent the cop from investigating further yeah so even though me as a player i'm looking at this person saying you're acting very suspiciously i want to investigate you yeah and then looking at my screen saying but if i don't get if i don't investigate them i get some points yeah. and I'm, it's that kind of that uh, conflict that should be made. i think it would be it's a I think it's interesting because it would be a very different game without the competitive because you'd just be following the story. You'd be yeah. making those decisions. You'd be mm-hmm. trying to you'd be trying to solve the case. I don't think when we played it as competitive, we were trying to solve the case because no. the hidden agendas kind of take over. Yeah, and I think like going back to Cosmic Encounter, if you had your hidden agenda from the start, so this is this is the kind of person that you are. This is how you want the game to go to benefit you. So for you as a pacifist in Close Encounter, you wanted to basically not engage with as much combat as you wanted to because that benefited yeah. you and, and the race that you were. That was like your role. I, I feel that if that was how Hidden Agenda started, like this is your investment in the story, this is what you want to get out of it, it would have played out a lot better. We, we maybe would have had more of those conversations outside of the game because you're given time to develop to engage with the story and develop and shape it how you want it to go in the long run. It was only like three quarters of the way through that it gave us all like an, in- an individual agenda each of how we want the story to end. Mm. So it felt really kind of hollow in the end a bit. Like I just, I think I'd, I'd like to play it again. Um, I mean, I think it's tell it's very telling and I don't, this will probably sound uh, worse than I, I mean it to be. It's very telling that it's not a full price game. It feels like a. Well, it's very short. It, yeah, it feels like an, an add-on. It feels like a almost like a proof of concept type thing. Yeah. It doesn't. It doesn't feel like a game that you'd spend forty-five quid on. And that I think that's telling that the fact that they've not they've not marketed it in that way as well. I, th- I think the, the playlink stuff re- works really well. 
and I'm all for that. Like, I love the idea of the fact that you don't have to hand someone a controller with 15 buttons on it and go, this is how you play the game. It's a lot like yeah. you just you just use your phone. And it's also like an encyclopedia. So you've got like... Oh, that's a great bit of it. So every time you introduce a new character, suddenly ping on your phone, a biography's been updated. Yeah. You've got a list of all the biographies, the events that have happened and the choices made. So you've yeah. kind of got this little kind of resource in front of you. But again, because you never know what your investment as a story is going to be from agenda to agenda like that using that is no real advantage to you because you might be researching a bit of biography about a character and what they want from the story and what they're doing but then suddenly you're being asked to work against what you know then it's it's kind of like well i didn't really need to learn all about that yeah i mean there was in like the the profiles of all the characters you interact with you'd have a profile about uh, like a young girl that was introduced in the very first scene, she's, yeah. she doesn't. She never appears appears again in the game. Yeah, 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 but yeah. there is a profile there, which when you're starting the game, makes you think, okay, well, I need to know who this person is. And yeah, bits and pieces. But then, you, but, but then she never comes back. Yeah, or you could have been, or for example, you could have been given a hidden agenda, which is you know you don't don't investigate any more about the girl, and you're like, well, I kind of wanted to know a bit more about her. Yeah. But again, if you were given something overarching that was carried on throughout the whole game, some sort of overarching agenda from the start, you could. I feel like we maybe would have had a bit more of the conversations they wanted us to do. Yeah, you know? I think if if you could if you if the hidden agenda was more the end point of the game yeah. as opposed to a 50-50 because the the hidden agenda's came down to a 50-50 decision. Yeah. So it would and it was depending on if you got people to go along with you yeah. then then you succeeded. If for example the end point of the game was you should be arresting this person yeah. over the entire course of that game you're uh, if I want to arrest Sergeant Jones Good name. Thank you. Powerful um, if I, Sergeant Jones. If I, want to, if I want to arrest Sergeant Jones at the end of this game, all the way through, I'm going to be trying to make him yeah, seem exactly. more and more suspicious yeah, in any way that I can, both in terms of gameplay yeah. and conversations. And I think also, that would be a better end point. And the other thing that would do as well is that when someone had a hidden agenda, suddenly they became very talkative. <laughs> and like suddenly like they started talking about why they wanted the story to go and like hang on a minute like you've been very quiet like just because you've not had a hidden agenda before up until this point and now suddenly you've got some investment in the story so i think that yeah like and, and going back to cosmic encounter like that that how that game works where it's a very sort of simple war game from the sort of the veneer of it it's just, it's just basically a numbers game you're committing you're trying to get foreign colonies onto a different planet and you just commit ships and numbers to it highest number wins you land on that colony like it's a very very simple game but what makes it so beautiful is that you are given factions and roles and that is your character and you know the i the more that you invest in that character and who they are and what they stand for the richer the the experience is what what's actually interesting about Cosmic Encounter, we played it twice. If we'd only played it once, yeah, I would have probably sat here and said, "Nah, eh, I'm not a big fan," mm-hmm. because I think that first time, because it was my first play of it, I was getting to grips with it, trying to understand yeah, the yeah. character I'd got, and kind of, I'm not the best in the games where you have to debate and work with people. Settlers of Catan has never worked for me because I'm just terrible at that kind of thing. What? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I Hang just, <laughs> I just, I just really annoy people very early. I don't know will ever work with me, so I'm no good at that. Mass deforestation. <laughs> but I think if I, if we talked about it after that first game, um, I would probably be like, oh, I'm not really sure mm-hmm. about this. It didn't really work for me. I, I finished last. I had a chance to win, but someone blew it for me i can't remember who it was it happened twice in the two games <laughs> I, I was a chance to win and someone blew it for me Love um it went completely out of my hand the second time maybe it was the character i had maybe it was just having a bit a better idea of the rules and i think i mean you guys might disagree with me i think that second game was a better experience than the first game yeah, it, t- yeah. it tended to i think everyone was a bit more at ease with the game and everyone knew what they were doing yeah there was, was, like, was a bit of um we had a problem with one of the characters which was a bit like when you uh because essentially each faction breaks the game in a way they they will have an effect on the game that it works against the rules sometimes you can pull a character out which is kind of like hang on does that really work like that like that seems a little bit overpowered or that like that rule reads a little bit funny so sometimes you can be a bit unlucky and like read something wrong or interpret something in the wrong way which kind of like suddenly people got their phones out and you're going back to the rules and going like hang on like is this really how it works i think that happened in the first game which is which is a bit of a shame and can be a detriment to the experience so i think yeah you're right on the second game we're a bit more settled in we kind of had a bit more grip on it and it flowed just a lot a lot nicer 
but it's just got that lovely thing of the fact that you not have to wait for your go because it's your go every go. It's just that yeah. some two people are the main players in their encounter. You can choose to who you want to join with, to yeah. ally with, the defender or the offender, let's say. Yeah. And then they'll play, they'll flip their cards at the same time. And it'll be a numbers game often unless they want to negotiate and come to some kind of accord. Mm -hmm. But then if I see if I'm there as an ally for Dan as a defender and I see that he hasn't got enough numbers, I look into my hand and I've got any plus numbers, I can add them to his support. Mm -hmm. And then somebody will play a card which will just completely ruin all of that. And everyone's like, oh, no. Yeah, yeah. And it's just wonderful. There's no kind of tension in that regard. It's always short-lived. Oh, why did you do that? Why did you do yeah, that? Yeah, it's like, always short-lived. Allegiances are always kind of like... I was constantly dicking over someone in the one turn and then the next turn going, friends? <laughs> what was actually interesting in that second game, um, I, for my character, because you get cards, when you defend people, however many people you defended if you're successful, you, you get to take on like new cards, which could be yeah, like attack encounters, could be various different types of cards which help you in the game. Um, for whatever reason, every time I tried to defend people, which would have got me cards, I failed. And so I just <laughs> I had no cards. and all, I just needed cards because I could do nothing. And eventually something happened and I got, I had the chance of getting like four cards, which is the maximum you can get. And as I was just about to take them, someone else threw down a card, which basically said, no, you can't have yeah, anything. Yeah, no and it rewards, kind of yeah. just crushed my soul. About five minutes later, I was working with that exact same person yeah, that, to win the game. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Because suddenly I was like, I got a minute, I can win. Because we just came to an agreement because he knew he needed my help to win. And he just needed to give me a lot to share the yeah, win. Yeah, like, yeah. yeah. That was the moment I was allied with you. And I, I could see Dan was in trouble. I could see he hadn't got... He really wanted it to be a negotiation, but I knew that Dan didn't have any negotiation cards. But I had a card that, that allowed me to force him to negotiate, but I didn't realise that Dan had already found his own clever tactic. <laughs> and I didn't even look at what Dan had played. Yeah. And I quickly came in, literally jumped the gun, yeah, threw this card down. Dan just looks at me and goes, Thought okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> well great, plans. Chris. Now I've got to do this. I, I had literally I'd planned the entire thing. Of like, if this all plays out, I'm going to win this game. And I planned it all out meticulously. And then Chris came and just blew it all trying out. To help. I was trying to help, you yeah, know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just Beautiful. love it. I loved it. Honestly, I just wanted to keep playing it, keep playing it with all these different combinations. How many different alien races are there? Uh, so there's 50 in the standard 50 box. 50 in the standard and box. We were, and we were playing, and, and, they're, and they're nicely filtered into, red, into green, yellow, and red. Uh, green's sort of, uh, if you're just starting to get to grips with the game, uh, you play as the green ones, and then you can sort of start filtering in some of the orange ones that are a bit more advanced um and the red ones as well uh, like for really experienced players there's different like um there's a technology add-on that you can add there's tons and tons of expansions that basically just add more alien races and a few more mechanics if you if you want to play that way so it's constantly evolving every each game is genuinely different and and one of the things that cosmic encounter does really interestingly is that we play get we played a game a couple of weekends ago um me and some other friends and we played with the uh yellow factions and one of them was so overpowered that me and everyone else in the game were forced to focus on them and i and i and i really love that like change in dynamic that it gone from a very like solo game of solo domination to right everyone we need to stop this player or else mm -hmm. they are going to win like we need to form, uh, I think we called it like the the UN Space Pact or something. Like we need to draft a resolution. Well, in every single game, regardless of who you were, your your I was your, drafting constantly. Your, your your race was and constantly we... drafting treaties to basically excuse <laughs> you from any battle and redrafting. That yeah. was the chosen. Yeah. yeah, the chosen. The chosen were a, a, a complicated diplomatic race of people, but we had a constitution that was definitely written in pencil. Yeah, and that, that, that only really came into effect when it benefited you. <laughs> oh, written on an Etch-a-Sketch. <laughs> oh, that was Staying In with Dan Frost, Sam Turner and myself, Chris Darby. If you've enjoyed this episode and want to hear more, make sure to subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts or maybe Mixcloud, Acast, Spreaker, Stitcher, Google Play or wherever you prefer to get your podcasts. If you'd like to leave a review too, we'd be really grateful. Visit stayingin.podbean.com for more information and links to all the things we've covered in this episode. And also, come find us on Twitter at StayingInPod. Thanks for listening.